This is an Action News Jax election 2020 update. And we are less than a month out until Election Day, but voting has already started. Nearly all 50 states are already voting by mail or early in person, including Florida and Georgia. Important to note that in Election 2016, 5% of Georgia's vote came in from mail in ballots. That number was 28% in Florida. If you live in Florida, mail in ballots must be received by November 3rd in Georgia. That deadline is November 6th. Some states are accepting ballots through November 17th. So if the race is close, we may not have a winner on election night. I'm Tanika Hughes. Over the next hour, we hope to help you as you head to the polls by explaining the key issues and letting you hear from local candidates. Florida is pivotal in this election and here's why. In the past 100 years, the winner of Florida has won the presidency all but four times. That's 25 elections. The last time the person who won Florida did not take the Oval Office was 1992 with George H. W. Bush. He lost to Bill Clinton. The time before that was in 1960 when Richard Nixon lost to John F. Kennedy in 1924 and 1920 were the only other two elections. Here's a look at how Donald Trump did in Florida and Georgia in 2016. In Georgia, he beat out Hillary Clinton by 211,000 votes, and the lead was less than that in Florida. Trump narrowly won Florida by less than 113,000 votes. Action News Jack's Courtney Cole is helping us to get real about voting in 2020 with a look at why Florida is such a key battleground state in the presidential race. Why? Does Trump or Biden need to win Florida? Well, I think it comes down to the fact that we're just so darn big. The third biggest state in the country with a lot of electoral votes at stake, 29 to be exact. Michael Bender, a political science professor at UNF, says the other reason Florida is so important is because when it comes to statewide elections, it's always such a close call. We saw that in the Senate races in 2018 and in the governor's race in 2018. We saw it in the presidential race in 2016, Trump winning by a little more than a percentage point. Is it possible to go on to win the presidency and not win Florida? It is possible. Uh, it, it gets extraordinarily difficult if Trump were to lose Florida for him to go on and win. But Biden still needs the black vote and the Latino vote, and President Trump needs the suburban women vote. That's going to go a long way to getting Trump elected, uh, at least in Florida. And there are six amendments on Florida's ballot. We're going to walk you through each one. Immigration has been a heavily debated topic in Florida and one that voters will have their say in. Courtney Cole is back again, breaking down Amendment 1, which will connect the right to vote with citizenship status. Amendment 1 would add two words to the state constitution, clarifying that only citizens are allowed to vote in Florida. We spoke with the amendment's creator to learn why that's necessary, because that's already the case in Florida. Here's what the language will say when you see Amendment 1 on your ballot. The amendment provides that only United States citizens who are at least 18 years of age, a permanent resident of Florida, and registered to vote as provided by law shall be qualified to vote in a Florida election. It's not a big change. It, it, I believe it changes the word every citizen to a citizen. Matt Corrigan, the dean of the College of Arts and Sciences at Jacksonville University, says the law in Florida is pretty clear. It's just reemphasizing the citizenship requirements of vote. You already have to have that. It's, I don't think it's a really necessary uh, amendment. That's something the amendment's creator, John Loudon, with Florida citizen voters strongly disagrees with. The problem is the Constitution, everybody thought you had to be a citizen. The Constitution says that all citizens are electors, but it doesn't say non-citizens are not electors. Unlike other amendments, there's no opposition group in Florida. No one's campaigning for non-citizens to have a right to vote. And it's probably because everybody thinks it uh, is the law and should be the law. And so this is really just a clarification of what everybody agrees. You should have to be a citizen to vote. Action News Jax asked Loudon if this amendment plays into a mindset put out by President Trump, who's cast doubt on the legitimacy of our electoral process. I've heard the cynical argument that uh, this is somehow supposed to help President Trump. Um, I think, uh, in fact, our polling shows that 
that the strongest support for this is naturalized citizens, regardless of party. It probably passes because people, you know, want to make sure that you have to be a citizen to vote. At least 60% of voters must approve an amendment for it to pass. Courtney Cole, CBS 47, Fox 30, Action News Jax. And Courtney will be back to explain the five other amendments on the ballot ahead in this program. If you want to take a closer look, they're on actionnewsjax.com. Just click on the Voter's Guide 2020 banner at the top of our website. There are two constitutional amendments and one referendum on the Georgia ballot. Amendment one controls how money is collected and spent through fees and add on taxes. So if you vote yes, you're OK with lawmakers deciding how money is used instead of putting it into a general fund. If you vote no, you don't care how the state spends the money. Amendment two deals with sovereign immunity. That's a legal doctrine that basically means the government cannot be sued without its consent. If you vote yes, you want people to be able to sue in state court if they want to challenge whether a state or local law is constitutional. Governor Kemp vetoed this measure last year. Finally, the referendum on the Georgia ballot could make charities that own real estate exempt from property taxes under certain conditions. The Biden campaign has a political ad running in Florida featuring two retirees from the villages, but does it go too far with his claims? Action News Jack's John Bachman put it through the Action News Jack's truth test. The open shot sets the scene. Roger and I decided that we wanted to move to the villages. We were ready to retire. His ad shot in Central Florida goes right after a key Florida voting block, seniors, and one key issue, COVID-19. My husband and I are both concerned about the virus and catching it. The ad then shows the couple's grandchildren, with the couple saying they have been apart from their kids for six months. Then comes the first claim. While I don't blame Donald Trump for the virus, I blame him for his lack of action. But is this fair? I think this is, you know, this is a, a resident issue for a lot of older voters. They're, uh, you know, they're harmed by the coronavirus, even if they're not getting the coronavirus because they can't live the kinds of lives that they were able to before. As UCF political science professor John Hanley notes, polls have shown Joe Biden performing ahead of Donald Trump with seniors, a group Trump won in 2016. As for COVID, a survey from Echelon Insights shows Biden getting higher marks on ability to handle COVID-19, an idea that the ad closes on. Overall, we rate this ad mostly true. It is just one person's testimonial, but the available data for now seems to support her assertions. Action News Jack's helping local voters get to know the candidates and what they stand for. Here's a look at the races you're going to see on your ballot in Florida. One race is for Florida's third congressional district. And John also spoke at length with Democratic candidate Adam Christensen and Republican candidate Kat Kamek. Florida's 3rd Congressional District stretches, as you know, from Orange Park to Gainesville to Ocala. What do you believe are the biggest issues affecting your constituents? So I think much like the rest of the country, we all have the same concerns about protecting our constitutional rights, you know, protecting uh, our Second Amendment, our freedom of speech, uh, defending the unborn, supporting President Trump. These are all things that I think conservatives across the country um, all care about. Same thing that have been affecting them for the last 40 years. You got giant companies that keep coming in, cutting prices, cutting wages, wiping out all the family owned businesses and consolidating entire markets. Another race on the ballot is for Florida's fourth congressional district. And here's part of my conversation with Democratic challenger Donna Deegan. Well, Donna, Florida's fourth congressional district encompasses most of Jacksonville, Nassau County and St. John's County. And you touched on health care. But what do you believe are the biggest issues affecting those constituents? A lot of folks across the political spectrum tell me they are very concerned about the rising cost of health care. They're concerned about having their families covered, especially now that so many people are dealing with this COVID crisis. They're concerned what's going to happen if I end up having lingering situation here and I don't end up having the ability to be covered for a pre-existing condition. I think there are a lot of people focused on that. But I'd say beyond health care, the major issues that I'm hearing from people out there in the community are they are very, very concerned about the climate crisis. Uh, we live in a state that is surrounded by water. We live in a community with a military base that's right on the water. We have communities that are flooding on sunny days. And there's a lot of talk about resiliency, um, but so far there's been more talk than there actually has been action. And frankly, we've got to at some point take it past uh, just talking about shoring things up. Infrastructure is incredibly important. We have to take some steps there. But if we don't deal with the climate crisis, and that is acknowledging 
that we do have an issue with fossil fuels and starting to take steps away from that uh, to, to invest in solar energy and other energies that, that really would help our economy and sustain our state. Action News Jax has reached out to the Republican Congressman John Rutherford staff several times. We've been trying to schedule an interview since August and our offer still stands. In Georgia, one race on the ballot is for the state's first congressional district. Action News Jax Don Lopez spoke at length with Democratic candidate Joyce Marie Griggs and Republican Congressman Buddy Carter. Georgia's first congressional district covers more than a dozen counties. What do you believe are the biggest issues affecting those constituents there? It's the jobs. Into that is the health care issue. So jobs, health care are the primary issues. The people are suffering terribly bad in our district. Well, in the country, of course. Well, there's no question about it right now. It, it's COVID and it, it's the pandemic. And we passed three and a half packages that have addressed um, the needs of our citizens, the health care needs, research and development into a vaccine. Uh, the PPP, the Paycheck Protection Program, all the great programs that have come out, um, the stimulus that went out that keep people afloat, uh, suspending uh, uh, people from, from being evicted from their apartments. You can watch the full interviews for the races we just mentioned on actionnewsjacks.com and find a wealth of information about races, candidates, and mail-in voting. This is really a recipe for chaos. In the time of the pandemic, mail-in and absentee ballots have become the cornerstone of election 2020. We will be able to handle all election mail. Unsubstantiated claims of voter fraud have plagued the process. There's been so much talk about voter fraud. We have not seen, historically, uh, any kind of coordinated national voter fraud effort uh, in a major election, whether it's by mail or, or otherwise. Well, this is a typical Trump distraction. It's trying to make uh, everybody wonder whether or not uh, the election will be legit. The number one question I get in every election, do you really count the mail ballots? Yes, we really do, and they're first. You're gonna be counting these things forever. In 2016, absentee mail-in ballots and early voting made up 40% of votes. In Georgia, 61% of voters 50 years and older believe mail-in voting will mean more fraud. That's according to an AARP poll in September. Seniors say votes cast in person would be more accurate than those mailed in. Republicans long criticized methods of getting ballots to the polls, including ballot harvesting. And that's the party of a third party collecting absentee or mail-in ballots and then dropping them off at collection sites. But is that safe? Election experts say fraud is extremely rare. In Minnesota, a video surfaced of a man driving around in July with hundreds of ballots for a city council candidate. State law there prohibits a third party from collecting more than three ballots. But for the primary, the courts lifted that requirement and allowed anyone with proper ID to collect and drop off unlimited number of ballots. The three ballot limit has been reinstated for the general election. And here's where Florida and Georgia stand. Last year, Georgia's legislature passed a law banning ballot harvesting. It allows only family or someone living in the voters home to send ballots in their behalf. In Florida, there is a three ballot limit that does not count the designated person or ballots they may be sending for their immediate family. The voters designee can pick up the ballot no earlier than nine days before Election Day, and they must sign and submit an affidavit. And if you want to wait until Election Day to try to use a designee to get your ballot to the polls, you have to have proof of an emergency. On the other side, hundreds of thousands of ballots are being rejected in the general election. In the primaries, nearly 559,000 ballots were rejected, according to a new analysis by NPR. That's 230,000 more than in the 2016 general election. In Florida's March primary, 18,000 ballots were rejected. In Georgia, there were more than 11,000 ballots that were rejected. The reason could be anything from missing signatures, incorrect signatures, or sending the ballot too late. As Action News Jack's Courtney Cole shows us, more than 100,000 people have requested mail-in ballots in Duval County alone. When you receive your vote by mail ballot, it's going to look like this, with the voter's name and barcode in this blank space, so the supervisor of elections can track it through the mail. I know there have been some concerns that some people are afraid their party is listed on the outside. It is not here in Duval County. Okay. Once you open it, there's three parts, a secrecy sleeve, the ballot itself, and the return envelope voter certificate. 
when they make their choice, we ask that you use black because that's what the machine reads the best. Phillips tells me it can be a black pen, black ink, even a black Sharpie like the one he's using. You're gonna completely fill in the oval on the race that you choose. I shouldn't circle around it. Nope. I shouldn't put an X. Nope. A check mark. No X, no check. After you vote on your ballot, you put it into the secrecy sleeve and put it inside the envelope to send back. And make sure you sign it because if you do not sign it, we can't verify that it's from you. And you can mail in your ballot or have a designee drop it off at your supervisor of elections office. And in some counties during early voting, you can also drop it off at an early voting location. But on election day, the only drop off site is the supervisor of elections office in your county. That's on election day. If you're unsure about where to send your ballot, contact your local county supervisor of elections office. You can find phone numbers and email addresses on actionnewsjacks.com. Just look under the election tab. The FBI urging voters to protect themselves from hackers and false info. The FBI's Protected Voices Initiative. It aims to give you tools to safeguard your email, Wi-Fi, social media, and other potentially vulnerable areas. It started as a way to protect political campaigns, but the FBI is sharing knowledge with voters as well. Action News Jack spoke with Jacksonville's special agent in charge about why the agency started this. Because there are a lot of malign actors and there could be even cyber actors out there that do want to change your opinion or do want to give you misinformation or disinformation to sway and change your own vote. You can find FBI resources by heading to actionnewsjacks.com and click on the action button. The Jacksonville Jaguars want you to get in the game for November's election. The team launched a campaign to register voters and Avery Jones told Action News Jacks John Bachman he's proud of the effort and that the Jags are more than just football players. We did not come here to compete. We came to embarrass these boys. In the trenches on the football field, it's rough. It is not for the weak. Oh, it was heavily Mr. President, you would have been much later, Joe. Mr. President, much, later. much like politics in 2020. So defensive lineman Avery Jones was ready to take the lead for the Jaguars voter registration campaign, get in the game. I think that's one of the biggest misconceptions uh, people have about voting is if I vote for the president, then I should see something then and now. And it doesn't work like that. You got to vote within your state to get the change that you want for you, your kids, your neighbors and all your friends. While the presidential campaign is getting most of the attention, the team is encouraging young people to vote local as the team gets more vocal on issues like their march to support Black Lives Matter, Jones says he and the team are ready for the critics. They want to hold you accountable for all the little stuff that you do in the off season and your personal time and tell you that you're a role model. But as soon as you try to take a bigger step from stay in school, don't do drugs, and then it's a problem. Jones says he's aware of comments online, but has perspective by remembering who came before him. If you think about what they did back then, we really haven't done nothing. So if we let that type of pressure or that type of talk that they're doing online uh, affect us, then we're really just proving them right. In the end, for Jones, this big man loves football, but he's even bigger than that. I think we did a great job of showing we're more than just football players. I mean, we're people. You know, we care about this country. We care about our lives. We care about this city. The pandemic changed the way Floridians registered to vote. So let's take a look now at last year's number. According to the state, the number of people registering through the DMV accounted for half of registrations that year. This year, the number of voters registering through the DMV dropped nearly by half. But the number of voters registering by mail is up more than 45,000 and online registration is up more than 150,000. That's a three year high for both and more than double from last year. The only other method that saw a significant jump from last year was registration through armed forces recruitment offices. Amendment 4, it passed with 64% of the vote. It immediately restores voting rights to more than a million nonviolent offenders upon their release and completion of probation. I'd like to register to vote. I've changed my life. You know, I did my time for my actions. Once you become a felon, your rights and opportunities are t taken away. Today is a fresh start. People want to vote. They're not all Democrats, they're not all Republicans. People want to be able to be in the process. 
And there's been controversy around Amendment 4 since 2018. In the election that year, 64% of voters approved restoring voting rights to 1.7 million Florida felons who finished their sentences and probationary periods. It is important to note that does not include people convicted of murder or sexual offenses. Last June, Governor Ron DeSantis signed a bill narrowing Amendment 4. This was a Senate bill that required felons to pay all legal fees connected to their convictions before their voting rights could be restored. So this set up a relay between state and federal courts. Civil rights groups filed a federal lawsuit and this may a federal court rule that Florida's pay to vote system was partially unconstitutional. The state appealed in August and won, and in September, the federal ruling was reversed. So that means the financial requirement is in place, affecting about 770,000 Floridians. So this matters because those 770,000 felons could help to decide who wins the election. In 2016, Donald Trump narrowly won Florida by just 113,000 votes, and at the time, Florida had 13.5 million registered voters. Since then, the number of registered voters has risen to more than 14 million. So take a look at the numbers for this year. As of August 31st, the Florida Department of State says that there were more than 600,000 new voters. Nearly 147,000 voter registrations were removed. The Florida Rights Restoration Coalition was behind getting Amendment 4 on the ballot in 2018, and there are a number of celebrities and public figures who've been donating to help ex-felons pay fines and fees so they can vote. Mike Bloomberg, one of them, he raised some $16 million. Florida's attorney general is asking the FBI and State Department of Law Enforcement to investigate that contribution. NBA superstar LeBron James and other black athletes and entertainers donated $100,000 to that fund. And singers John Legend and Florida native Camila Cabello teamed up to start the Free to Vote crowdfunding campaign. And so far, $25 million has been raised, and that brings a total to more than $36 million to help clear the path of Florida felons to register to vote. The deadline to register is Monday. The clock is ticking. Before Amendment 4, Florida's Constitution permanently banned all felons from voting unless they were granted clemency. According to the Brennan Center, between 2010 and 2016, the number of Florida felons stripped of their right to vote grew by nearly 150,000 to an estimated total of 1.6 million. In Georgia, felon voting rights are automatically restored once the sentence and probation is complete. So if you're waiting for a trial in a felony case, you are still eligible to vote. You can also vote while you're paying off your fines. Another proposal on Florida's ballot would make it harder for voters to decide changes to the state's constitution. Action News Jack's Courtney Cole back again breaking down Amendment 4. Florida voters have had a big say on state law during past elections. In the last decade, medical marijuana was legalized and reformed felons earned the opportunity to get their voting rights back. This amendment would make voters say yes twice. Here's what the language will say when you see Amendment 4 on your ballot. It requires all proposed amendments or revisions to the state constitution to be approved by the voters in two elections instead of one in order to take effect. The proposal applies the current thresholds for passage to each of the two elections. Matt Corrigan, the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences at Jacksonville University, says the amendment isn't without its merits. The argument is, is that we change our constitution too much here in Florida, and there's some evidence of that. Uh, we have lots, we've changed our Florida constitution much more often than we've changed the U.S. constitution. The group behind the amendment, Keep Our Constitution Clean Incorporated, says Amendment 4 will help cut down on the number of seemingly frivolous changes. Opponents say it would make changes more difficult and ultimately more expensive, and would also cause delays for necessary changes. One thing is clear though, a yes vote from voters means they'll have to say yes to any amendment twice in the future. I don't think this passes because this puts another hurdle up for voters and voters generally don't like that. At least 60% of voters must approve an amendment for it to pass. If it is approved, it could go into effect during the 2024 general election. And remember, there are six amendments, and Courtney is also going to break down Amendment 5, which would help homeowners hold on to property tax money a little longer. The homestead exemption can take a big bite off property taxes each year for homeowners. This amendment would give them a little more power and protection. 
Here's what the language will say when you see Amendment 5 on your ballot. It's proposing an amendment to the state constitution effective January 1, 2021 to increase from two to three years the period of time during which accrued Save Our Homes benefits may be transferred from a prior homestead to a new homestead. Right now, permanent Florida homeowners can exempt $25,000 of value from their primary residence. Homeowners can transfer that benefit to a new home within two years of selling their previous home. This amendment extends that another year. I think people will agree that this is this, you know, especially for Florida homeowners, it gives them lots of flexibility uh, that probably passes. Matt Corrigan, the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences at Jacksonville University, says the amendment is a no brainer for homeowners. However, it probably hurts the tax base. So I think there's uh, local governments who may be concerned about that. It's the reason that the League of Women Voters of Florida is against it. The amendment wasn't started by another private group, but instead submitted by the Florida legislature. At least 60% of voters must approve an amendment for it to pass, and it would take effect on January 1st. Courtney Cole, CBS 47, Fox 30, Action News Jax. Taxes are front and center in election 2020. Uh, the Donald Trump campaign, an ad, it takes aim at Joe Biden's tax plan. And Action News Jack's Paige Kelton investigates the claims, taking it through our truth test. The ad begins with comments Joe Biden made to a crowd in South Carolina February 27th of this year. If you elect me, your taxes are going to be raised, not cut. That was edited and is out of context. Take a look. Hey, how many of you did really well with that $1.9 trillion tax cut that increased... Really in good shape, right? Really changed your, well, you did. Well, that's good. You must, I'm glad to see you're doing well already. And I'm good, but guess what? If you elect me, I'm not gonna have you, your taxes are gonna be raised, not cut, if, you're, if you benefit from that. Here are the unbiased facts. Joe Biden has pledged not to increase taxes on Americans making less than 400,000 a year. Groups like the Urban Brookings Tax Policy Center say his tax proposals would lead to the largest tax increases for high-income people. What does that mean for you? More taxes taken out of your paycheck. That's Fox News reporting from June of 2019, eight months before Joe Biden made that comment in South Carolina. Higher gas prices at the pump and utility bills at home. On Location Inc. is a consulting firm in Virginia specializing in energy analysis. Its September report, paid for by the American Petroleum Institute, says the impacts of stopping oil and gas production would mean higher household bills and moderately higher gas prices. But here's the catch. Joe Biden hasn't said he would stop all production. He's only promised to ban new oil and gas permitting on public lands and waters. Skyrocketing medical bills. I searched all the articles posted July 16th of last year by the Wall Street Journal and found an opinion piece by the assistant editor. He broke down Biden's plan to create a new public option health care plan. You see, this isn't in quotes. We believe it's the campaign's interpretation of that article. The ad goes on. You compete with illegal immigrants to keep your job. An economy in ruins. That Washington Times report was about Joe Biden's plan to grant citizenship to 11 million illegal immigrants. It never mentioned jobs. But Joe Biden has not directly addressed how that policy would impact the job market. President Trump is bringing jobs back. Historic gains. 10.6 million new jobs in four months. President Trump Trump fixed our economy before. He's doing it again. That 10.6 million in new jobs is accurate. The ad doesn't mention an average double digit unemployment rate during that same time. Overall, political spin and the out of context information makes this ad mostly false. In the studio, Paige Kelton, CBS 47, Fox 30, Action News Jax. What is true is that the president still hasn't voluntarily released his tax returns to the public. U.S. presidents have been releasing their tax returns to the public since Richard Nixon in 1973. The Tax History Project tracks financial records of past presidents, and it reports that Nixon made his tax records public after someone leaked him. They were from the IRS, and they showed some of his records, and they showed that Nixon paid around $800 in taxes in 1970 and 71, despite earning around $200,000 a year. So that that unleashed blowback against Nixon. He eventually released his returns from 1969 to 1972. Nixon's successor, Gerald Ford, kept that tradition going. 
But President Trump has not released his tax returns to the public, which breaks decades of presidential precedent. In records obtained by the New York Times, the president paid no federal income taxes in 10 out of 15 years beginning in 2000. And that's because he reported losing more money than he made. They also show he paid only $750 in federal income taxes the year he took the Oval Office and the year later. Vice President Mike Pence released 10 years worth of tax returns in 2016, but hasn't released any since taking office. In contrast, Vice President Joe Biden and California Senator Kamala Harris released their returns. Biden's 2019 tax returns show that he and his wife paid nearly $300,000 in federal income tax last year. They purchased a home, about $985,000 that year. And Senator Harris's returns show that she and her husband, they paid about $1.2 million in taxes last year. Their take home income was about 3 million. Releasing returns has historically been an effort to show transparency and increase confidence in big government. And once again, almost immediately, this newest ad from Joe Biden makes its first assertion. Donald Trump stepped off the golf course and signed an executive action directing funding cuts for Social Security. Is this true? To answer that, we first have to look at what the president actually signed and how we pay for Social Security. As for the president's order, it directs the U.S. Treasury to defer payroll taxes starting on September 1st. Although, and this is important, after January 1st, those back taxes may still be owed. But payroll taxes are how we fund Social Security. So any pause in collection would mean less money for Social Security going forward. A program that is projected to run out of cash as soon as 2024. As UCF political science professor John Hanley notes. We're getting closer to those moments. And so running those down more quickly could get you into trouble uh, much more quickly. But the ad continues. He also proposed slashing hundreds of billions of dollars from the Social Security Trust Fund every year. This is a little more ambiguous. Since the cuts Trump proposed were to Social Security disability insurance and supplemental security income, not the retirement portion of Social Security. Overall, we rate this ad half true since it's unclear how many employers will actually change their withholding process since the money might be due anyway. And the cuts to the trust fund are not as clear. A live look now at Capitol Hill, where senators are meeting with Supreme Court Justice nominee Amy Coney Barrett. Her confirmation hearing set to continue despite senators testing positive for COVID-19. The political tilt on the nation's highest court would shift more strongly to the conservative side if President Trump's nomination is confirmed. Action News Jack's Paige Kelton back again, looking at his pick and the confirmation debate ahead. If confirmed, Judge Amy Coney Barrett would mean a 6-3 conservative majority that would hold true for decades to come. Judge Barrett serves in the Seventh Circuit and is a teacher and scholar at Notre Dame. If confirmed, she become only the fifth woman to serve on the Supreme Court in its history. And at 48 years old, she'd be the youngest justice on the current court. Republicans in the White House are pushing for a speedy confirmation timeline. If all goes well, uh, then certainly a, a, a vote on the floor uh, sometime before the election. The Senate's top Democrat Chuck Schumer says he won't meet with Judge Barrett and vows to try to slow down the process, although it would only take a simple majority vote to confirm her. A vote for Coney Barrett is a vote to strip away health care from over 100 million Americans. <laughs> The debate over the Affordable Care Act, as well as abortion rights, are also reshaping the 2020 election. Paige Kelton, CBS 47, Fox 30, Action News, Jax. Coney Barrett was a clerk for Justice Antonin Scalia, who died in 2016. You may remember President Obama nominated Merrick Garland to replace Scalia about nine months before the 2016 election. That nomination did not get confirmed in the Senate. And here's what Coney Barrett had to say in 2016 about that situation. We're talking about Justice Scalia, you know, the staunchest conservative on the court, and we're talking about him being replaced by someone who could dramatically flip the uh, balance of power on the court. It's not a lateral move. The president has the power to nominate, and the Senate has the power to act or not, and I don't think either one of them can claim that there's a rule governing one way or the other. If confirmed, Coney Barrett would solidify a 6-3 conservative majority on the high court, and this would weaken the power of Chief Justice John Roberts, who is widely viewed as a swing vote. 
His vote was critical in upholding the Affordable Care Act, known as Obamacare in 2012. So let's take a look at the remaining justices. Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg leaves the court with three liberal leaning members and five others who lean conservative after her death. The high court is set to hear a third challenge to Obamacare one week after the election. Coney Barrett's confirmation could also determine future rulings on health care, civil rights, and the landmark Roe v. Wade case. Action News Jack's Ben Becker continues our coverage. I'd like to welcome in at this time Florida Atlantic University political science professor Kevin Wagner, also a constitutional scholar. Kevin, when you heard this choice by the president, you thought what? I, I think it was pretty predictable. The, the president had indicated even before he ran for office that he was going to pick uh, justices that were conservative. There's an old moral to the story in the Senate. If you have 51 votes, you, you can pretty much do what you want. And as long as uh, the Republicans hold together and, uh, and 51 of them agree, then they can get this done uh, before the election. If the Democrats got in after this election that they could try to expand the Supreme Court, is that right? Sure. So the Constitution doesn't speak to the size of the Supreme Court. That's set by statute. If the, the minority in the Senate feels aggrieved by this process, in other words, rushing it through right before an election, when there was some question about whether that was appropriate, um, they can, uh, you know, when they if they choose. Uh, remember, it has to be by statute, so they need support of the House and the president, but they could pass a law uh, changing the size of the Supreme Court, making it 11 justices, making it 15 justices. Uh, depending on, uh, you know, whether or not they have, you know, sufficient political ability to do that. All right, Dr. Kevin Wagner, we have to leave it there. Thank you so much for joining us on Action News Jacks. When it comes to health care cuts, the ads from political action committees or PACs are making some huge claims, and they've started launching attacks on both President Trump and Joe Biden. John is back again where he found some fuzzy math when he put one of the ads through the Action News Jacks truth test. There's a lot to unpack in this ad, so let's get to it. 57 million Americans have lost their jobs. Many have lost their health insurance, too. Here's the thing about that 57 million number. That was at the peak of the layoffs, but since the end of April, almost half of the jobs lost have come back. As for health coverage, about 12 million people have lost coverage since March, according to the Economic Policy Institute. The ad continues. But Donald Trump remains laser focused on gutting health care, proposing billions in cuts to Medicare, and trying to destroy the Affordable Care Act in the middle of a pandemic. The Medicare cuts is something Trump proposed before the pandemic. And for the ACA, his Justice Department is still seeking to end large chunks of the law, asking the Supreme Court to strike down the law something that would wipe out coverage for 23 million Americans. It's very close to being, you know, completely well sourced. Um, and if the Trump administration had come in with a, an alternative plan to deal with Obamacare, uh, then I think this would be a different rating. As UCF political science professor John Hanley notes, the ad sticks pretty close to the facts, although it uses timelines that benefit its narrative. Overall, we rate this ad as mostly true. Some context is missing, but the claims on health care are correct, even if the jobs numbers are peak pandemic and the Medicare cuts were pre-pandemic. When you cast your ballot, you are making decisions for property taxes and for health care for years to come. Florida voters will also be deciding on minimum wage. So Courtney Cole is breaking down Amendment 2. Right now, the minimum wage in Florida is $8.56, which is $1.31 higher than the federal minimum wage. I spoke to the people on both sides of the amendment of Amendment 2 to help you figure out how you will vote. Here's what it says on the ballot. The amendment raises minimum wage to $10 per hour effective September 30th, 2021. Each September 30th thereafter, minimum wage shall increase by $1 per hour until the minimum wage reaches $15 per hour on September 30th, 2026. From that point forward, future minimum wage increases shall revert to being adjusted annually for inflation starting September 30th, 2027. The group that got the amendment on the ballot is called Florida for a Fair Wage. That's connected to Florida Attorney John Morgan. He says the amendment would help fix two things. A broken system that allows a person to do better financially by staying home, by receiving food stamps, welfare, and subsidies, and what he calls the underlying tension in America. Everybody calls it a bunch of different things, but it's actually income inequality, that the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting po poorer, that 
40% of Americans don't have $400. And at some point in time, it breaks. Morgan also believes the COVID-19 pandemic showed us that our essential workers are doing some of the most important jobs, but making the least amount of money. Opponents of this amendment, like the Florida Restaurant and Lodging Association, say this amendment would ultimately mean fewer hours, fewer jobs, and fewer opportunities. But I think when you mandate it like this, and you mandate it from everywhere from Mariana, Florida, down to Miami, which have very different markets and very different market pressures, very different labor markets, um, you create a situation where that it's not sustainable. You're going to have damage to businesses. You're going to have increased costs for the community. The group also believes a sustainable wage can't be made through a ballot initiative, but requires systemic changes in education and community development. Matt Corrigan, the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences at Jacksonville University, believes it will be hard for the opposition to win this one. The chamber is saying this is the exact wrong time to be doing this, especially with COVID, because it, it, it may increase, it will increase, um, you know, uh, costs for small business owners. And so it, it's a it's a it's an interesting time to be proposing this. I think in general, minimum wages increases, minimum wage increases when they get on the ballot usually win. If the amendment passes once the wage increases $15 in 2026, it would be adjusted annually for inflation. At least 60% of voters must approve an amendment for it to pass. Courtney Cole, CBS 47, Fox 30, Action News Jax. Your right to vote is a powerful one, and this election will shape local communities whether you vote or not. Newly elected State Representative Angie Nixon says her road to politics started with her desire to change her underserved community. Her journey has come full circle, and she's sharing her message of action and the power of the vote. When her daughter was the target of racist cyberbullying, she helped her create the Moxie Girl comic book about a black girl superhero with powers in her Afro puffs. When single moms struggled to get supplies for their babies during Hurricane Harvey, she organized a supply drive. Concerned about food deserts in our community, she opened a healthy smoothie and sandwich shop on the east side. She's joined protests against racism and police brutality and went public about her battle with COVID-19 and raised concerns about how the coronavirus has disproportionately impacted the black community. I've done a lot. <laughs> Sometimes I feel like I don't do enough. Angie Nixon's drive to do more recently landed her a seat on Florida State Legislature as the state representative elect for District 14. And so that's why I decided to get involved because I know that we deserve to flourish. And I ran my platform on flourishing, coming together and working together with the community uh, and working towards what we deserve, um, which is so much more than what we've been getting over the years. Nixon says she experienced those disparities growing up in Northwest Jacksonville and being bused to school in Mandarin. The community looked different. The houses uh, looked much different, bigger. Uh, the roadways looked cleaner and nicer. <laughs> there weren't potholes in the street and things like that. And so I just knew that I wanted my community to aspire to that. I felt that we were somewhat lacking in certain areas, and so I've always just wanted to do more for the community. Nixon has turned her years of community activism into political power, and she's encouraging everyone to exercise their personal power to vote in November, especially those who may feel overlooked and unheard. My message is if voting didn't matter, um, folks wouldn't spend <laughs> billions of dollars during each electoral cycle to um, suppress our vote or to try to get folks to vote for them. And so the importance of voting is if you just look at the things that are going on now, the incidents with Breonna Taylor, with George Floyd, right? These, the folks that are in power that determine whether or not these folks receive justice are elected officials. And so if we want justice for our communities, if we want better schools for our community, better roads, better infrastructure, we have to ensure that we elect people 
to those positions of power to again do the right thing by us and to get us what we deserve. A big part of your election experience are poll workers making sure there are enough ready and healthy to man the polling precincts is a top priority for local supervisors of election. Action News Jack's Courtney Cole found out in Duval County that means training 2000 workers. 2000 is the magic number. So far they've had 300 new poll workers sign up to take this class and they have about 1800 on their roster. But when COVID-19 numbers go up, poll worker numbers tend to go down and that's why they need as many as possible. This matters more to me this year than ever. Elaine Dickerson is one of the dozens who filled this room this afternoon for poll worker training class at the Duval Supervisor of Elections. She says her oldest son, registering to vote is what inspired her to sign up. I feel very good about this. Um, I have some dear friends who, who <laughs> train us in this class and that's what got me involved as well. It's important for the supervisor of elections to have more than enough poll workers because they'll likely need them. During the March election, they had more than 100 in reserve and used almost every one of them. In August, they had about 40 poll workers in reserve. Trainees will see a slideshow during training that goes over basic elections laws, everything they need to know to get them through the day. What kind of identification is allowed, uh, how to look up a voter on the uh, EVID, the electronic voter identification. The chief elections officer of the supervisor of elections also tells me they always have some experienced poll workers in there with the newbies. Dickerson tells me she's looking forward to learning a lot and seeing how things work behind the scenes. It matters and I think I'm going to get some great, great information out of it and I can share it all around. Reporting in North Jacksonville at the Supervisor of Elections Headquarters, Courtney Cole, Fox 30, Action News Jax. Now, poll workers do get paid. The Supervisor of Election tells Action News Jax most poll workers do want to be a part of the process and serve the community. Duval County has the highest population of veterans in Florida. On um, the ballot is the future of military families after a veteran passes away. We're breaking down Amendment 6 now. The Florida legislature put the amendment on the ballot to help spouses of disabled veterans keep their property taxes lower, even after those veterans pass away. Here's what the language will say when you see Amendment 6 on your ballot. It provides the homestead property tax discount for certain veterans with permanent combat related disabilities. It carries over to such veterans surviving spouse who holds a legal or a beneficial title to and who permanently resides on the homestead property until he or she remarries or sells or otherwise disposes of the property. The discount may be transferred to a new homestead property of the surviving spouse under certain conditions. The amendment takes effect January 1, 2021. Matt Corgan, the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences at Jacksonville University says voters will overwhelmingly check yes. This expands the benefit from the, you know, the combat uh, wounded or affected veteran to their spouses. And, and, you know, I think this wins easily because I think most people want to support the spouses of of uh, combat, combat affected veterans. However, similar to Amendment 5, this would reduce the amount of property taxes collected by the government, which would impact the funding of public services like police and firefighters. At least 60% of voters must approve an amendment for it to pass. Courtney Cole, CBS 47, Fox 30. Action News Jax. An American hero at the center of a political ad that takes aim at Vice President Joe Biden. Page is back again, taking that ad through the Action News Jax truth test. Army Rangers are taught to make tough decisions under pressure. That's why I picked up an enemy grenade and threw it away from my men and was awarded the Medal of Honor. A new ad from a pro-President Trump political action committee features an American hero, Master Sergeant Leroy Petrie, slamming Vice President Joe Biden. America deserves strong, decisive leadership. For 40 years, Joe Biden has failed to meet that standard. Petrie then lays out his case. 
He opposed taking out Osama bin Laden. That statement is accurate. In 2012, Joe Biden told reporters he advised then-President Obama that he should wait for further confirmation that bin Laden was inside the compound in Pakistan before moving forward with the raid. Biden says he told the president to follow his instincts. Mr. President, my suggestion is don't go. We have to do two more things to see if he's there. He walked out and said, I'll give you my decision. The Trump ad goes on. And he's too silent as our cities and our nation's flag burn. That's Master Sergeant Petrie's opinion. As for the quote there on the screen, that comes from a Washington Post article published June 1st by two reporters who break down the facts behind that statement. Since then, Joe Biden has publicly condemned violence at demonstrations and supported police officers. Violence of any kind, no matter who it is coming from, is wrong and people should be held accountable. Burning down automobile lots, smashing windows, setting buildings on fire. Joe Biden is too weak to be our commander in chief. That's more opinion, an opinion delivered by a Medal of Honor recipient. Based on our fact check, the Action News Jack's truth test shows this ad is mostly true. Paige Kelton, CBS 47, Fox 30, Action News Jacks. All right, so here's a look at the debate schedule. Leaders announced the Miami debate on October 15th would be virtual, and the president backed out, but has since said he would be a part of it, prompting Biden at one point to back out as well. So we're still waiting to find out what's going to happen with that. I can tell you that the president is planning on holding a virtual rally on the Rush Limbaugh show, and we know that Vice President, the former Vice President Joe Biden, is planning to do a town hall with voters in Philadelphia. So. We'll work to keep you posted on air and online once we learn the details of the debates. Moderators may not fact check claims in real time at the debates, but you can count on Action News Jacks to do that. Page fact checks the claims that President Trump and Joe Biden made in their first in-person debate and gets perspective from our political science expert. We're ignoring all the political spin about Tuesday's presidential debate to give you a nonpartisan fact check of some of the claims you heard from both candidates. No, I, I, the answer to the question is no. Ukraine. It, no, I, sir. With a billion sir, dollars, if you that don't get rid is of absolutely you know what, you're, wait, not stop. You're true. Tape you're doing it. You're going to have tape. true, gentlemen. Interruptions and personal attacks ruled the night, but Americans did hear the candidates on a number of topics. Let's start with this claim by the president. A, a fixing of the, the VA, which was a mess under him. 308,000 people died because they didn't have proper health care. That's misleading. Factcheck.org says the president's number was off, and the VA report he was citing said the vast majority of deaths occurred before Obama took office. When we were in office, there were 15% less violence in America than there is today. That's false. Government data shows violent crime declined 15.7% during the Obama-Biden years. But FBI figures show last year's violent crime rate was 5.1% lower than in 2016. And the decline continued into early of this year before the pandemic hit. I asked Flagler College Associate Professor Dr. Arthur Vandenhouten about candidates using those kinds of figures. And the fact is, studies and data can be used by anyone out of context to, to argue either side. We did see both sides pulling on those numbers, trying to use those numbers in a way that put either themselves in the best possible light or put their opponent in a negative light. Um, this is not unusual. This is, of course, pretty this is politics. The president also said several inaccurate things about vote by mail ballots. They're losing 30 and 40 percent. It's a fraud and it's a shame. That's false. While some states have reported problems with incorrect or incomplete ballots, there's no source or evidence that it's 30 to 40 percent. The president may have been referring to recent ballot issues in New Jersey, where election officials threw out 19 percent of ballots that were invalid, but they weren't lost in the mail. Dr. Vandenhouten called the president's fraud accusations stunning. It ended with the president of the United States, duly elected in 2016, calling into question the legitimacy of an election that's less, that's 30 days away, 35 days away, right, just over a month away. Um, it was an extraordinary scene. 
He is not for any help for people needing health care. Because, because he, in fact, already has cost 10 million people their health care that they had from their employers because of his recession. That's misleading. That number came from an Urban Institute study, but it also said most would regain insurance from another source, leaving 3.5 million uninsured. On manufacturing jobs Tuesday night, neither candidate gave an accurate account. I brought back 700,000 jobs. They brought back nothing. Even before COVID, manufacturing went in the hole. The fact is 237,000 manufacturing jobs were lost in the first seven months of the Trump administration. But through November of last year, 499,000 manufacturing jobs were added, not 700,000. The candidate's next debate is October 15th. Vice presidential candidates Mike Pence and Kamala Harris will face off October 7th. Paige Kelton, Fox 30, Action News Jax. And we know that uh, Vice President Pence and Senator Harris did debate last night. Well, this election is much different from any other election because we're in the middle of a pandemic and more than 200,000 Americans have died from COVID-19. In a new round of political ads, President Trump makes claims about how he handled the virus versus how his opponent would have. So Paige is gonna take the president's new claims through our truth test. The presidential candidates are spending millions to get your attention and your vote. The latest political ad for the Trump campaign touts a recovering economy and uses Joe Biden's statement that he would shut it down against him. We put the claims to the truth test. In the race for a vaccine, the finish line is approaching. The ad begins with optimism about an economy recovering from COVID-19. Safety protocols in place and the greatest economy the world has ever seen coming back to life. The greatest economy the world has ever seen. The ad doesn't offer any facts to back that statement up, making it subjective. But the number you see there on your screen, 1.37 million jobs created, that's accurate and comes from the U.S. Department of Labor. But Joe Biden wants to change that. I would shut it down. Saying Joe Biden wants to change that is also up to interpretation, but his statement is used in context. I would shut it down. I would listen to the scientists. That was Joe Biden's response when asked if, as president, he'd consider shutting the country down to stop the spread of COVID-19. The ad goes on. Why would we ever let Biden kill countless American businesses, jobs, and our economic future when President Trump's great American comeback is now underway? Job and stock market experts say the U.S. economy appears to be recovering. The quote that payrolls increased by nearly 1.4 million is accurate and from the Department of Labor. Unemployment in August was 8.4 percent, down from 10.1 the month before. So aside from a few lines of opinion, overall, the statements in this ad are mostly true. In the studio, Paige Kelton, CBS 47, Fox 30, Action News Jax. The last of six amendments that Florida voters will decide on sets up the rules of engagement for future elections. Here's Courtney Cole with more on Amendment 3, which could allow all Floridians to vote in certain primary elections. Florida is a closed primary state. That means if you want to participate, you would have to officially register for a political party and will be blocked from voting in the other party's primary. Amendment 3 would change that for certain races. Here's what Amendment 3 says on your ballot. It allows all registered voters to vote in primaries for state legislature, governor, and cabinet regardless of political party affiliation. All candidates for an office, including party-nominated candidates, appear on the same primary ballot. The two highest vote-getters advance to general election. If only two candidates qualify, no primary is held, and the winner is determined in a general election. Candidates' party affiliation may appear on ballot as provided by law. Stephen Vancor with All Voters Vote, the committee sponsoring the amendment, says this change would allow the non-party affiliated voters who've been shut out of primaries to let their voices be heard. Irrespective of your party and you're a registered voter, you mm -hmm. still get the right to vote and choose the person who represents you in Tallahassee. It works well in our 400 plus municipalities. It works well in most of our counties. It works very well in, in uh, other states. Van Cor would argue that it also forces those running for office to be accountable to all voters and not just their base. 
Senator Audrey Gibson of Florida's 6th District argues that passing this amendment is dangerous because it would have a negative effect on minority representation and goes against the Voting Rights Act. The Voting Rights Act is all about um, minority access, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and representation by people of color and, mm -hmm. and those people choosing a candidate who understands their issues, right? Um, that they connect to. And then you have someone come and set up a system that totally um, is against that principle. I don't know if I buy that argument, but, but that argument's out there. Matt Corrigan, the dean of the College of Arts and Sciences at Jacksonville University, thinks the end result would be more voters getting a say. We have a good percentage of, of non-party affiliated voters who don't get to vote in those primaries. So I do think this opens it up for them. At least 60% of voters must approve an amendment for it to pass. If it is approved, it would go into effect January 1st, 2024. Courtney Cole, CBS 47, Fox 30, Action News Jax. Again, there are six amendments for Florida voters to decide on. And if you want to take another look at Courtney's reports, they're all on actionnewsjax.com. Click on the Voters Guide 2020 banner at the top of our web page. And you can count on Action News Jax to fact check claims made during this election and bring you nonstop coverage on air and online. You can watch us on Amazon Fire, Apple TV, and Roku 24 hours a day. Action News Jax also with you on the go. Just download the Action News Jax app. It is free in your app store. This has been an Action News Jack's Election 2020 update.